Okay, so let's start the uh, final lecture. So uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, baryons and determinant operators in large N series, uh, which was actually the title of my lectures. <laughs> so, <laughs> so in the last two times, like uh, two lectures, I didn't really like uh, discuss that. So, and finally we get to that point today. But originally I was also like uh, thinking about explaining uh, real baryons in the large N series, but uh, based on this paper, but if I do that, then I end up like talking about other people's work. <laughs> so I decided not to do that and just give a reference to this paper. So this paper is actually largely, I think, unknown, but like, it's a kind of nice paper in which like they first discussed the relation between the baryons and the hole on, on the wall sheet. So let me, so let's start. So. So today I'm going to talk about baryons and determinant, but uh, in order to, before doing that, let me just uh, give you some motivation why I want to do that. So, so let's consider large N QCD. And we know that in the large N, QC, in the large N limit, uh, QCD uh, becomes a theory of basically like a weakly inter interacting particles. And the basic building block or a basic particle is basically mesons made up of like a two quarks, quark and antiquark. And uh, similarly, if you consider a large N, N equals four super mu theory, the basic object is a single trace operator. And the reason why you have a trace rather than something like bilinear is basically because in N equals four super mu, all the fields are in the adjoint representation of the gauge group, whereas in large N QCD, you have fundamental representation. Uh, but uh, of course, in the QCD side, on the QCD side, we know that there exists yet another important, like uh, excitations or particle, which is basically baryons, which is like a color singlet made up in this way. And similarly, you can also define the analogous object on the n equals four super mu side. And because you only have a joint representation, uh, this is the like a closest analog that you can have. And this is basically. Uh, well, up to some uh, trivial factor, it's actually determinant of this matrix Z, where Z is some complex scalar in N equals four super mills. So, so let me now give you uh, why baryons, why determinants are interesting in N equals four super mills. So, so the first reason why it can be interesting is that like a, well, as I just said, it's the analog of the baryons. So, and baryons are actually like hard to analyze even in a large N limit. So it's kind of nice to like develop some techniques to analyze the analog of the baryons. And another reason why it can be interesting uh, from the holography point of view is because it's uh, ideal probe of the space-time, especially ADS space-time. And the, the reason why it's nice is because, because of the conformal dimension. So the conformal dimension of the determinant operator is of order n because it's made out of n fields and which is much larger than uh, one, but it's much smaller than n square. And because it's much larger than one, uh, you can treat the dual particle, uh, the particle in ADS dual to this operator uh, to be some classical particle and localized and moves along geodesics. So the reason is because uh, the Compton wavelength of the particle is much smaller than the ADS radius. On the other hand, because it's much smaller than N square, it doesn't back react. It doesn't deform the ge geometry. So in this sense, uh, potentially uh, this baryon, uh, oh, sorry, this determinant operator can be a very nice probe of the ADS spacetime. And more generally, uh, any, anything that scale like this can be a very nice probe. And this scaling is the scaling that you expect for the uh, D-brain in, in ADS. And indeed, actually, previously people studied uh, observable, which are dual to D-brains in ADS, 
uh, with the purpose of like a reading of the metric of ADS space time and like a trying to analyze the locality. And for instance, there is a series of work by Frank Ferrari, starting from around 2013, uh, in which the, he kind of tried to analyze the uh, various uh, deep brain like probe uh, in gauge series to, and try to read off the metric of the dual space time. And in addition, there is also some attempts to understand uh, the interior of the black hole. Let me just mention this paper by Lo uh, Horowitz, Lawrence, and Silverstein in 2009. So in this paper, they basically considered the D brain, which is due to the Coulomb branch of uh, certain n equals four, well, n equals four super is in certain background and trying to read off, uh, trying to understand like uh, what is happening in the interior of the black hole. So there was some attempts for that as well. And, but I should emphasize that so, so these are basically motivation, why determinants are very interesting. But at the same time, uh, determinants are very difficult. And even in the large gen limit. And that is, you can, well, you can actually see that by just looking at the but com computation of the two-point function. So let's first talk about the computation of the two-point function of single trace operator. So at tree level, uh, it basically, if you want to compute a two-point function of single trace operators, then you just need to do this, uh, like a planar weak contraction, which is like this in the double line notation. And, and if you want to analyze the, uh, like a loop correction coming from, say, like a gluon exchange, then we know that all we need to uh, in compute is the gluon exchange between nearest neighbor uh, Propagators, because if you if the gluon connects the non-nearest neighbor propagators, then you get the non-planar uh, diagram, and which is suppressed by one of n, and this gives you uh, coupling square because you have two vertices, and then you increase the face by one, so you get this factor, which nicely combines into the Tohoft coupling, which is finite in the large n limit. On the other hand. Uh, if you consider a determinant operator, then what you have here is like a, like a gigantic object which is contracted with the Ipsilon tensor. And even for the tree level, the contraction is complicated. You can like, a, well, if I were to draw some picture, it's, some, it's gonna be something like this. Yeah, because basically because Ipsilon tensor doesn't know about the ordering, it's basically anti-symmetric. But uh, the problem arises when you, well, the real problem arises when you try to uh, consider the one loop correction. So because the Ipsilon tensor doesn't know about the ordering, basically the, you can connect any two propagators using the gluon. And that gives you, first of all, GM mu square and the combinatorial factor, which is uh, N choose two, because you have N propagator here and there. And that gives you, basically, in the large n limit, lambda times n. And this n is really problematic because we you start from the uh, tree level and then want, want it to compute the one loop correction, but the one loop correction is very large in the large n limit. And things becomes worse, actually, at higher loops. So, if you compute the things at higher loop, then tree level you get this, and one loop you get this, and then at the next loop you actually get lambda square m square. And it gets worse and worse. So it seems like there is no hope of doing reasonable perturbative expansion, large and expansion for the uh, of correlation function involving determinants. Yes, <laughs> yes. Right, exactly. So that's 
where I'm going to get, actually. <laughs> so, so naively, you, 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 if you look at the uh, structure, then you might say, okay, there is no hope, but it's actually not true. And that was explained for the case of baryon uh, by Witten. And for the case of uh, uh, determinant operators, uh, it's discussed by combinatorial argument by uh, Aharoni and his collaborators. And what is happening is actually exponentiation. So although if you just naively do the perturbation theory, you have something like this, but it turns on general grounds, you expect that this actually gets exponentiated into something like this. And it is actually not, this ori not the original series, but this exponent that has a nice uh, reasonable uh, lambda expansion, where lambda is the perfect coupling. And so, so this was, as I said, uh, this. So this is what you expect uh, on general grounds. So then, like if you look at the answer, then you see that there is some large, of large thing in the exponent. And if you see something like that, so normally you think that there should be some, something semi-classical. So, so something should, becoming, should be becoming some semi-classical. And indeed, we know that a, like a kind of semi-classical ex, like a representation exists, for example, from the low energy point of view, because the baryon is the uh, soliton in uh, like a pi on effective Lagrangian. And we also know from holography that uh, determinants or baryons are typically given by D-brains. And D-brains become semi-classical in the, or classical in the large N limit. So indeed, like uh, we know from these, like uh, effective or dual description that things become semi-classical or classical, but uh, it is not obvious how we get these semi-classical descriptions, starting from the field theory, say, from n equals four super mls. And, and the goal of today's lecture is to derive some, something that becomes classical uh, from n equals four super mls. Can I stay up this case? So, usually consider some in one. Yeah. And uh, I'm trying to understand for one. Right, right. So, what is the, is there a corresponding statement at the level of uh, the state? Like, at the level of the determinant itself? Take the perturbation of the determinant is here. Understand as a part of the large expansion. Um. Right, so, so I think it's related to what I'm going to talk about. So, so you can get some like a semi-classical description even at weak coupling. And yeah. So, so what, I mean, there's a lot of work on this mm -hmm. 30 years ago. So what uh, you do actually in QCP type of problems is that uh, you don't really discuss the determinant in terms of the gauge. Mm -hmm. But the German in terms of the chiral field actually. Mm -hmm. And in a sense, the chiral field forms uh, the mean field mm -hmm. in which you want to fill up the formula. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that uh, was unclear. Mm -hmm. that, that's, mm -hmm. that's perhaps one way of. I see, I see. The in the background of the mean field rather mm -hmm. than. 
Ah, I see. Yeah, yeah, I see, I see, I see. Yeah, that's also the approach discussed by Witten, right? I guess. Like, you got some like a hard refork, like. Witten hasn't done. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Okay. I see. I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, how, how do you? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Level of calculation, I have to extract out this epoch. If I want to see this mm -hmm, uh, calculation, so, so uh, is it like you know, like I can consider uh, this theory with n plus 1, mm -hmm. and then take a ratio to the theory with n, mm -hmm. and see that that has all the n's cancelled out? Is that a uh, copy? Copy? Uh, okay. Um, in some sense, it's Close. So I rewrite the determ. Okay. This, yeah. Yeah. This is what I'm going to talk about. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. So so let's talk about the computation. But before talking about the computation, yeah. Before talking about the computation, let me just. Uh, so so that second section is determinant in n equals 4 super mills. and But before talking about the computation, let me just give you a brief review of n equals 4 super mills, and to make sure that everyone is on the same page. Uh, so n equals 4 super mills is maximally supersymmetric. Uh, gauge theory for, in 4D. And then, uh, it, because it's maximally, and in 4D, it actually has 16 supercharges, and in addition, it turns out the theory is superconformal, and it also has a 16 superconformal charges. And there is also an R symmetry, which is basically like a global symmetry, or the flavor symmetry, and which is SO6, which is basically uh, isomorphic to SU4. And, of, and as I said, the theory is actually conformal, at any value of the Tafut coupling, and that gives you SO4, comma 2 group, which is uh, SU2, comma 2. And combining everything, uh, it turns out that the theory has a superconformal symmetry, and the superconformal group is given by uh, the group, which is called PSU. To comma two slash four, and the bosonic part is SU two slash SU two comma two and SU four, which is which are precisely these symmetries. And the field content is given. So, so you have like six scalars and phi i, where i runs from one to six. So this is a vector of the SO6 symmetry. And then you have one uh, uh, gauge field, a mu, and combining two, the physical degrees of freedom is eight. And similarly, uh, there is eight uh, fermions. And the degrees of freedom match. All right, so, so this is the field content. And another thing I need to say is that uh, so all these fermions and phi's and a's are in the adjoint representation, and everything is basically in the same superconformal multiplet. Okay, so, so this was a super brief review of our n equals 4 super mu theory. And let's now uh, specify uh, what observable that I, I want to discuss. So the observable that I want to discuss is the correlation function of uh, M determinant operator and one single trace operator. Uh, let's put it X. And, and the determinant operator 
uh, I chose it to be a specific form. So dk is given by determinant of yk sum over i, yk i phi i, and So this yk basically uh, specifies the direction in SO6 space. And I furthermore require this e yk, as, so this is a six component vector, you can view it as a six component vector, uh, I choose it to be now. So in general, yk is a complex. And if you use, if you choose this, impose this condition, then you can actually show that this dk is a half DPS operator. And because of this, uh, because, and it, it preserved half of the supersymmetry, and because of that, it actually is protected, by which I mean the dimension is given by n at any coupling. Okay, so and the last operator, this O, is the single trace operator. And in general, it can be arbitrarily single trace operator, but uh, for simplicity, uh, I take it to be a uh, single trace operator made out of just scalars. Sorry, I, L. Okay, so this is the setup that I want to discuss. Anybody look that uh, see if you just have single trace operators of those type of polynomials, then we can envisage writing down regular Dyson equations. Mm -hmm. Have you looked at that, that type of thing for determinant type operators? Some sort of mean Dyson equation, is it possible? Uh, uh, you mean in the matrix model or in field theory? In, in, in gauge theory. In gauge theory, okay. They are basically showing that Dyson equations for I, certain classes of operators actually, which now they limit uh, those equations, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Just mm -hmm. wondering if determinant operator. I see, I see. Because you're talking about correlation function. Sorry, just aside. I see, I see. Uh, I, I, I don't actually know. So. Yeah, so the, in the case of loop equation, so you're, for example, discussing some Wilson loop and then put some single, usually you just put single trace, out, trace outside. But. If you take matrix models also, or, right. or even if you take gauge series, mm -hmm. you look in terms mm -hmm. of uh, polynomials of local operators, mm -hmm. you can write down fingerizing equation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just uh, thinking down the equation of motion, etc. I see, uh, I see, there, I see. Yeah, I yeah I don't know any yeah literature on that yeah. Well, that's that's discussed. Yeah, determinant operator and like I when. Let's say I've asked the determinant of what key of the expectation that you need. Uh, let's see. You just explanation. Yeah. Yeah. That's each of the KM trace log and then use the usual. It will be like deforming the action. Oh. And then use the usual set of points. Yeah. So you pick the usual set of points and you just calculate. We don't place any of the part key. Yeah. So it will be like a complex. Ugly looking what, potential log and you know. Yeah, yeah. Right. The fact that you're telling it just means it's the same thing. That's why it shifts it. That's why. Because it will be, that's why you exponent shift. So you get e to the k times trace log uh, of this thing. So okay. it will shift it. Then find a new row. Okay, so yeah. if you oh, have yeah. enough for well, that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. If, if k is order one, it doesn't shift. If and k is order yeah. one, it doesn't shift. So yeah. the end unit will shift to the second order, yeah. So it's a Gaussian yeah. matrix model becomes a non Gaussian matrix model in case of Right, the right, case. yeah.
Yeah. yeah, actually, yeah, that's also related to <laughs> something that I will probably discuss today. The single trace can be non-PPS, yes, it can be non-PPS. But uh, the computation you can, in principle, do at loop level as well, but uh, for simplicity, let's focus on how the computation goes at tree level. And And already at tree level, you can see some like a, something like this exponentiation or effective semi-classical description emerging uh, by rewriting the computation of n equals four super mills. So let's start doing that. And the starting point is to just like uh, express it in pass integral. And because we are in we are at zero coupling, we can basically neglect all the gauge field and just focus on the scalar part, scalar sector of n equals four and mills. So I insert these operators, and then I also put some action, which is this. And I index i is summed. Now, I'm basically going to perform a very similar trick as the one I did yesterday. So the, so the trick that I'm going to use is again integrating in-out, in-out procedure. And the first step is, because you have determinants, it's very natural to introduce uh, or rewrite it uh, in terms of fermion integrals. K runs from 1 to M. And then, so this fermion is zero dimensional fermion. And I just write something like this D4X, X minus XI. Uh, so using the notation of yesterday, I'm going to write it in this way. So again, uh, chi is the fundamental of UN and chi bar is fund anti-fundamental of UN. And I'm contracting indices, UN indices in this way and I'm not writing the UN indices and just use this notation. Okay, so so now, step two, so here I integrated in fermion, and in the step two, I need to integrate out uh, n equals four fields. So again, because we started from Gaussian action, and we exponentiated this phi, so we basically just need to uh, complete the square uh, in order to integrate out phi's, and that can be done in the following way. So let's see. So step two. So you... Yes, chi k is fundamental and chi bar k is anti-fundamental. Yes, of the gauge group UN. So, so the idea is to, okay, write this part. You will assume that the game group is always a student of US. Um, it actually doesn't matter here because uh, normally like uh, when you discuss variance, it really matters like uh, whether the gauge group is SUN or UN, but in N equals four super mills, all the fields are adjoined. So like uh, U1 acts trivially to all the fields. I mean, it's not SO. Ah, right, yeah, okay, it's not, well, yeah, it's not SO. In the case of SO, you can also define Puffian operator. So, so. Yeah. So then you have the time to be measured. Uh, yeah. So, but here you're not worried about it. Right, exactly. 
Okay, so yeah, let's see. So the action that I have here, so this part of the action, you can also rewrite it in a trace form by just putting uh, uh, broad to, to, the left, to the right. And that gives you this expression. And, and now I just uh, do the usual trick of completing the square. And that is going to give you uh, this expression. Plus this expression. So I choose SI. Yes. What happens to other fields in this? Right. So, so, so right now we are at three level. Yeah, lambda two fifth coupling is zero. That means you uh, ignore the right. Well. Right. So, okay. so, so, so the, the sky is only couples to five. It doesn't couple to Fermi also. There's a super symmetry. Right. So, so. Chi is just introduced for that. Yeah. So, and determinant only contains the scalar field. So, chi is only coupled to five. If you this is an action, uh, yeah. I mean, can you define a, can I extend the super symmetry? Because uh, these are all half PPS operators. Uh, so determinant operator is half BPS, but for why not? Uh, sorry, for for, for 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 now why yes. Uh, so the statement that this whole theory with this deformation is a super symmetry. Uh, <laughs> uh, no. Right. And I'm inserting a determinant at various different positions. So yeah. All right, so, so basic, uh, basically I just completed the square and where SI is inverse of the Laplacian times this factor. And because I need, the reason I need this is, uh, well, I need that in order to like a cancel uh, derivatives up, appearing here and recover this expression. And of course this can be just solved like a inverse Lapla Laplacian acting delta function gives you, well, if you are careful about normalization, then you also have like GML square here, and that, and then uh, you have X minus XK square over uh, YKI times chi K, chi K. So this is the expression for SK. SI. And the, the point that I want to emphasize is that SI is a bilinear of fermions. And now, uh, after shifting, you can just uh, integrate out the shifted field, which is like a phi minus s. And if you integrate out, then basically like this part is gone. And you are left with this action which is quadratic in S, which is quartic in fermion. And, right, so this is the results that you get. But uh, when, you do, when you integrate out this piece, you also need to remember, actually, and now you not only have determinant, but you also have single trace operator. So, so let's just briefly discuss like, what happens to the single trace operator. So the single trace operator, we assume that uh, originally it's given by this expression, like it's, it's given by some uh, uh, single trace operator made out of scalars. 
And now, uh, when you integrate out, you basically rewrite each scalar in this way, and then integrate out this piece. And if you do the integ if you do the path integral of this piece, then again this piece is gone. So that's why uh, after doing that integration, you end up with having this object. Okay, so this is uh, what you get after integrating out n equals four super ML fields. So to conclude, so the result of integration is given by this action, and the insertion of the operator is given by this. So this is what you get in step two. Was there any reason to include this single trace operator, not just the So, yeah, there is no reason if you just want to look at the like, emergence of the semi-classical picture. But the reason I included this because that's what I did in the, in the paper, and <laughs> I wanted to connect to what I did. So, but actually, yeah, actually you can see something nice happening uh, if you also include a single trace operator. And there is some, like, a emergence of something like matrix product state, which I'm going to talk about. Okay, so, so this is the step two. And now, uh, so in step three, so after doing the step two, uh, we are getting the integral of the fermions, and you have insertion of all of S, and then you have this action, which is 8 pi square over gm mil square times uh, i and j, so x, i, j, Square. So here I already, so the action I have here is SI, SI, and what you need to do is to just like plug this in, and then uh, after doing some manipulation, you get this uh, quartic action of fermion. Let me just write it, uh, which is, so in this notation, chi i, chi j times Chi j, chi i. So this is the structure similar to what we got yesterday. And this is quartic in fermium. But a uh, nice thing about this is that this uh, looks like a mat matrix multiplication. You have like a ij object and ji object, and then you are taking some trace. And right, so then the, in the step three, because you have the uh, quartic term in the fermion, uh, the natural thing to do is the hubbard stratton Witz trick. And, and if you do the hubbard stratton Witz trick, then you get basically this action. And most importantly, if you do the hubbard stratton Witz, typically, uh, this uh, prefactor gets inverted. So that's why you get this factor here. And then, uh, sorry, let me just write it. Eight pi square, rho ij, rho ji, uh, plus rho ij hat, chi bar i, chi j, and this rho ij hat is y i, y j over x i j square times uh, rho i j. So this is just to absorb this factor. So, and this is already nice because here, if I 
rewrite it in terms of the uh, uh, two foot coupling, you get something like lambda over n over lambda. So now you see some like uh, relation to some semi semi-classical picture. And you know to really get to the semi-classical picture, uh, the final thing you need to do is to integrate out fermions. So that's the step four. Integrate out fermion. And that is going to give you this expression. So now you only have this row field and you have, you need to remember that there was uh, OS and then you have some effective action of rho and there is n in front. And so this effective action is basically coming from this piece and, and the one loop determinant coming from integrating out fermions. But the point is that again, uh, there is actually, sorry, this is this. Uh, there is hidden u and index, and there are actually like a n fermions for each index i and j. Uh, so if you integrate out fermions, you get a factor of n, and that's why there is an overall factor of n here. And the result is given by this expression. Okay, so this is the effective action. So on the other hand, um, On the other hand, this expectation value of OS is just given by the weak contraction of fermions because OS was originally given by uh, product of S's and the S is written in terms of fermions. And what I did here is to just integrate out fermion, which is Gaussian. So you get, what you need to do is to uh, compute the weak contraction, so OS is the weak contraction. And using the propagator, which is uh, just the inverse of the kinetic Gaussian term in delta AB, where A and Bs are the UN gauge indices that I was not writing before. So this is the weak contraction. And so this basically uh, already gives you that uh, something semi-classical is really happening here. And what you need to, because it's now n is very large, what you need to do is just like a, take a variation of this action and then take, find the subtle point. And one interesting thing is that this trace, of, this trace of m is not the trace of original un, but the trace of m times n matrices because uh, rho ij and each index i and j runs from 1 to m, which is basically the number of determinant operators. So here you are seeing some like emergence of new matrix gauge or matrix flex degrees of freedom. And so, but if you really want to compute this correlator, you also need to know like a, what kind of expression you get for this O of S. But so let me just briefly explain. Yeah. N becomes very large. N? Then you N and Yeah. Then maybe the semi-classical method will not work. Right, exactly. So M becomes very large, you get some another like a young mills like expression yeah so right so this only works as like in the regime where d, d brains is probe and, uh, of course free case speaking what you have done uh, will go through for n, right n, right uh, but the interpretation of it is that it will be formed. Right, right. On the unknown side, you, this is the answer. Yeah, so. so done, didn't use. So, yeah, so yeah. This, this answer is okay, but you cannot take the subtle point. Yeah, yeah. The subtle exactly. point will be deformed. Yeah. yeah.
Yeah, that's true. Yeah. <laughs> so now let's see how the evaluation of all OS goes. And this is where you can see some connection with the matrix product state. So originally I had some like a single trace, so let's just write explicitly uh, the indices. And okay, I want to use a different color for different field. BC, and yeah, there is yet another color. Phi I3, CD. And, and let's follow the procedure. So the first procedure is to express it uh, in terms of, so re replace phi with s, where s is given by this expression. And let's just forget about this complicated piece and then talk about uh, how the fermion dependence emerges. So then uh, what you get is like, you have like a k1, k2, k3, because you need to sum fermions. And then uh, here, from here, you get a chi k1 a chi bar k1 b, and then from here, uh, chi k2 b, chi bar k2 c, and then from here, chi k3 c, chi bar k3 d, okay? And now, uh, what you need to do next is to do the weak contraction. But the point is that this weak contraction is proportional to identity in the gauge indices. And because of this, in the large n limit, this weak contraction is very simple. You just need to contract. The leading contribution in the large n limit is really the one which contracts the neighboring one. Because if you do so, then you get delta BB, which is of order n. Whereas if you don't do so, so for example, if you connect this one and this one, you don't get a power of n. So the leading answer is actually the one which uh, you we contract in this way. And that basically, and then, then we just need to put this uh, matrix here. So you have like a row uh, k1 and k2 and row, so inverse, k2, k3, and then row, uh, k3, and something. And now you ne also need to remember that you need to sum k1, k2, k3. Then you see that now you have some new uh, structure, which is again the product of matrices and taking a trace. So this uh, shows you that like actually this operator O, expectation value of the operator O or the correlation function of the op operator O is basically given by some new trace, single trace like representation. So, so you have like O of S and then this gives you trace of M times M matrix, and then you have M I1, sorry, M I1, M I2, M I3. So we are, and so the rule is that if you had phi I1, that's going to be replaced by some matrix M I1, and this M I is roughly, uh, if you carefully keep track of y dependence as well, then what you have is this. Times this row inverse matrix, this is, which is again n times m. All right, so, so this is the expression that you get. So this is a, actually a little bit interesting. So originally, uh, you had some single trace operator, like a trace of phi, phi i1, phi i2, phi i3, and you wanted, you wanted to evaluate that. Uh, but what you found is that expectation value of that is just given by a trace of some like a constant matrix. So this is in a sense a little bit similar to what people call large n uh, master field 
although the setup is slightly different. Okay, so, right, so this it was the structure. And another comment I would make is that, so this expression, uh, well, basically this expression gives you the correlation function gm once you replace uh, rho with the saddle point value. And so this uh, gm can also be written as some inner product between operator O, uh, between the state that describes the single trace operator O and the matrix M. Uh, and the state which describes matrix M is defined in this way. So you have, uh, you sum over one I1 to I L and then trace M times M, M I1, M I L, phi I1, phi I M, and then for O, I just take phi I1, phi I, sorry, I L. So, so this basically like a, if you take the overlap, this project and gives you particular component. Maybe I should have used J here in order not to get confused. And the sum is J, right? So, and the, the interesting thing is that this is uh, like a what, it, this is basically exactly the same form as what people call matrix product state. So, in, which appears in condensed matter literature. Okay, so, yeah. Right. And so this is what we got. But uh, let me just another give you give you another uh, physical intuition of the procedure that I just described. So, so this procedure of integrating in, out, in, out is a little bit complicated procedure, although it has a nice uh, graphical interpretation as I explained yesterday. But there is also some string theory interpretation uh, of this procedure in the case of n equals four super mills. So the idea is, so we know that basically n equals four super mill theory is uh, like a low energy excitation of a stack of D3 brains. And, and then we wanted to compute uh, the correlation function of determinant operator, but the idea is to realize uh, determinant operator as an inter intersection of uh, this D3 brain and uh, yet another D3 brains, like let's call it D3 primary. And if you consider this kind of situation, there, is an, there should be an open string which is connecting the original D3 brain and D3 prime brain. And this open string should have one UN index. And, and this is actually, uh, can be interpreted as chi and should be, one should be able to interpret it as chi and chi bar, which is the fermion that I integrated in. And in the next step of the procedure, I integrated out N equals four super mills. Basically, I, so that corresponds to like uh, replacing these D3 brains with the background. Yeah. Right, so that's actually something that I didn't quite work out. And it's actually not so ob obvious to really like uh, construct this uh, relevant configuration. Um, uh, just because uh, actually this D3 brain is not static, it's actually rotating because it has like a large R charge. So, and you, yeah, it, and it's, a, it's not, it, yeah, so for, yeah, it, yeah, it, technically it's a bit complicated to really 
construct this like a setup in flat space and take really take a limit. And but if you can find the relevant D3 prime brain, I think that should give you determinant operator. That's everything I can say. But this kind of procedure is more concrete for the Wilson loop, and people indeed actually found uh, the Wilson loop realize as re like by realizing it as the intersection of D3 and D5 or D3 and D3. So this part is a little bit conjectural, and that's why I put quotation mark. So, so the idea is that uh, this D3 brain, so now integrating out D3 brain should, uh, should change the geometry uh, into ADS. And once it gets changed to uh, ADS geometry, this D3 prime brain gets reconnected. And then now you have some open string, which is basically the bound state of two quarks, which is like a meson. And the interpretation is that this meson should correspond to rho, uh, which arise in the final step of rewriting. And yeah, so in that sense, uh, the rho at least captures some degrees of freedom of open string theory living on this D3 prime brain, which is uh, often known as giant graviton. Sorry? What is the baryons? I mean, baryons must have... Uh... Yeah. <laughs> right. Baryons, yes. Right. Yeah, I... Yeah, but I guess like a, yeah, one needs to specify like a specific setup in order to talk about that. Yeah. yeah I think the only brains, any brains to have uh, this type. Like you had any quarks. Mm -hmm. I mean, here you have an n quark and two quark. Right. Ah, you mean okay? I see. Right. Right. You're talking about the n values, the ones in the n, n, n of the UM variants are you talking about those are the original variants? Those were the D3 prime. Those were the D3 prime, the determinant operators. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Those, those, those were the original. This is what I'm not understanding how you can identify a determinant operator. So, right, so that's. The solid of three Einstein equations. Uh, sorry, so the. the uh, you need to have lots of them. I don't know. I don't know. A single right right so yeah right in, in the bulk yeah it's like a property. yeah <laughs> so but now you put m of them and uh, right. Uh, yeah, so he has put M of them, and now he has this uh, uh, theory of this Mesons. Yeah, so that was the interpretation. And, okay, so is there. Wait, wait, beyond? Uh, well, the only thing I can do is perturbatively keep track of interaction. Essentially, the idea is to just like, bring down interaction single trace term and then just like do the same analysis. So it hasn't been. Done. You, you did the integrability analysis. Yeah, we did the integrability, but actually we did also compute some like a one loop and two loop computation. But uh, my collaborator decided to use different methods, so we actually didn't use this method. <laughs> So, yeah, so actually the one loop part is not really done, I mean, with this method. But uh, mm -hmm. Right, yeah, yeah, it's, like it's going to be... Yeah, right, well, it... Yeah, I think something like that should, yeah, yeah, should be true, yeah. So there is some interaction term, and then just like a, so interaction term just modifies some some pieces of this 
yeah, a few of those. I agree. Okay, so, so in my title, I also put integrability, but so far, well, I, don't, well, I did talk about uh, Ising model, but <laughs> I didn't really talk about the integrability in N equals four, so let me just briefly uh, give you an idea how integrability plays a role. Uh, yeah, well, three point if you consider a three-point function and like a two determinants and one single trace operator, that's uh, protected. But if you consider four-point, it's already non-protected. Ah, okay, so, so there, there, there is also like a protected higher point function configuration, but in that case, you carefully like a choose like a wise. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, there are also no extremal ones, but yeah, which is more like a chiral algebra sector. Okay, so the final topic, relation to integrability. Yes. Right. Uh-huh. You mean theta term? Uh, well, because I'm in to fifth user to fifth limit, it, like a, at this level, I don't think you see theta term. Uh, but but let me see. So because I worked in a tree level, so you can in principle try to do this procedure uh, for finite n rather than infinite n, and then maybe you can try to see something, but. But yeah, you need to do a bit more anyway. Oh, that's a bit hard question because I'm in the two, like a large n limit. Yeah. Yeah, but okay. Yeah, I think that kind of question is also a very interesting question. So Right, 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 right. Yeah, 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 indeed. Yeah, I agree, yeah. And also, I think it's an interesting question to analyze baryons in, say, like a turn simon vector model, for example. And in that case, there, there is some duality, like which maps like a baryons to monopole operators, so. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Baryonic operators and monopole operators. So I think that is also an interesting topic to explore. Okay, so let's discuss the three, uh, integrability. And in order to discuss the integrability, I talk about three-point function. But uh, let's try to be specific. So I choose... Uh, D1 to be first determinant operator, sorry, first determinant operator to be determinant of Z plus Z bar plus Y minus Y bar. So this is a particular choice of Y vector, and Z and Y is a complex scalar. And D2 is determinant of Z plus Z bar minus Y minus Y bar. And so let's put it at position one and minus one, say. And then O is some single trace operator, non-BPS, but I just use Z and Ys. Yeah, sorry, yeah, just some position, yeah. Yeah, Egg, yeah, yeah, one minus one. So it's in some plane and then Okay, so, so the reason why I chose this uh, particular uh, kinds of single trace operator is because there is a nice mapping 
between this single trace operator and the spin chain, uh, which is kind of well known. So the idea is that if you uh, map this z to up spin and down and y to down spin, then you can formally regard this as a state in the spin chain. Of course, at this level, this is just a uh, rewriting, like a formal rewriting. But what is nice is that uh, people found that the dilatation operator at one loop acting on this sector of the operator, so dilatation operator acting on this sector of the operator can be actually identified with uh, the, the very standard Heisenberg spin chain, Hamiltonian. So this is the Heisenberg ferromagnet. ferromagnet. Yeah, I probably need minus sign here. So there is, so people actually computed the one-loop dilatation operator acting on that operator, and using that mapping, they found actually it's completely equivalent to this Hamiltonian. And the nice thing about this is that this immediately tells you that eigenstate, eigenoperator of dilatation operator is in one-to-one -one correspondence with the eigenstate of this H Heisenberg. And furthermore, what is nice that is that this H Heisenberg is uh, well known to be integrable spin chain. And you basically know how to construct the eigenstate systematically. And I'm not going to go to the detail of how to construct the eigenstate. Instead, I'm just going to give you some example. So, so the eigenstate that you can construct by using integrability method uh, is of this form. So the, so the simplest one is called one magnon state, which is parameterized by one momentum. And the state is basically given by this expression, where this uh, operator, sorry, this spin chain has like a down spin at n side. And you sum over n with a plane wave. And there is a generalization of this to multi-particle excitations. And this, the next simplest one is the two-particle excitation, two-particle state, which is given by, which is parameterized by two momentum. And, and the expression is given by this, exp this sum of plane wave. And finally, you multiply this. And this, the state which appears here is the state which contains downspin at n side and m side. And, and this. Uh, is what people call S matrix, and the point is that expression is uh, known. So this is just like some known function of P1 and P2. And, and furthermore, you can actually uh, generalize this construction systematically to multi-particle states, and that gives you the structure of the eigenstate of this Heisenberg spin chain, and using this mapping, you can translate that to the uh, structure of the eigenstate of the dilatation operator. So that basically determines what kind of ore we need to consider in order to have a well-defined conformal three-point function. Okay. So, so now let me just say uh, what happens if I apply all these tricks I explained before. Apply the trick. So to this particular case. And then it turns out, well, let me just remind you that the 
the point is that, like, starting from O, you can get some uh, expression. Now, because you have two determinants, uh, the, everything is two by two. So, and because you have, like, uh, only two kinds of fields, you have expression something like this. And if you work out what MZ and MYs are uh, in this particular case, uh, then uh, you find that this is actually proportional to sigma 1, the Pauli matrix sigma 1, and this is proportional to Pauli matrix sigma 2. So, and so this is kind of nice, and that basically gives you that uh, the final overlap can be, uh, so the final three-point function, G3, can be expressed in this way, where uh, M, I now use the spin chain representation, uh, Coming from this particular structure for right. the Z plus Z bar. Yes, yes. That right. So, yeah, so roughly speaking, uh, so what I had here is a diagonal matrix of Ys times uh, rho hat. But in this case, a diagonal matrix of rho hat be becomes this. And the reason is basically uh, so Z uh, couples. Sorry, uh, let's, let me try to remember. So, so if you consider Z, then uh, the contraction between Z field and D1 and Z field and D2 is basically the same because it both comes from plus one. So that's why you have plus one, plus one here. And whereas if you consider Y, so you get, well, plus one or minus one from here or the other sign on here. So that's why you have like a plus one, minus one. And then if you further solve for the uh, subtle point and then multiply it, then you get sigma 1 and sigma 2. Okay, so, right. So this is the structure. And then in terms of the spin chain, I just have like a sigma A1 dot dot, dot sigma AL times A1 dot dot, dot AL. But here I just need to and interpret a, a equals 1 is the up spin, A equals 2 is the down spin. So this is a particular like a, a matrix product state defined on the Heisenberg spin chain. And what was fortunate is that actually people in statistical mechanics actually already studied this kind of overlap, where this is the eigenstate of the Heisenberg spin chain and this is the matrix product state. And we can just use the result. And the result is kind of interesting. And the result is given by, so the result exhibits two features. So, so this. The first feature is that uh, the result is non-zero only when so this eigenstate takes this form, P1 minus P1, P2 minus P2, and dot, dot, dot. So the result is non-zero only when the eigenstate is, in a sense, parity symmetric by itself. And the next thing is that the final result is given by some simple expression uh, like this. And times square root of determinant g over determinant g plus, sorry, g minus. And, sorry, this, and this us is what's called a rapidity variable, which is related to the momentum in this way. So the final result is remarkably simple. So it's given by some product of simple function and some determinant. So I didn't explain what this determinant is, but the point is that the matrix element of this determinant, so this determinant. So it's the same G minus. G minus. So, so there are two different, <laughs> two different matrices. So this G 
is, uh, so let's say the number of uh, magnon is m, p 2m. So because I have this structure, the total number is always even. So this G is 2m times 2m matrix. And each element of like a matrix element of G is basically given in terms of these P's. And this G uh, minus is M times M matrix. And each element of G minus is also given in a very similar form as G, but it's slightly different. And, but this part is, I'm not going to explain that, but in the rest of the time, uh, I'm just give you an idea what is the physical meaning of this selection rule. And that's the final goal. You said it's a 2M by 2M matrix whose form is completely specified. Completely by, specified. By, uh, what is the, uh, it, it's some function of piece. Some function of piece. Yeah. So, okay, so let me just explain a little bit more. So for those people who know a little bit more about the beta equation. So, so basically G of uh, M, so IJ element of G is roughly speaking, you take a log of the beta equation, what's called beta equation, which determines the momentum. And so there are like a, a 2M beta equations because you have 2M uh, momentum and you need to define each momentum using the beta equation. And then you choose like a JS1 and then differentiate uh, with respect to momentum pi. So that is going to give you the gij. And so the idea is that you do that for all, all possible, like a treating all possible momenta to be independent, and that gives you determinant g. But you can also compute something like that by after imposing this selection rule. So that gives you determinant g minus. Yeah. Okay, yeah, so here, yeah, I'm really discussing single trace operator, yeah. yes. And so now the question is obviously, what's the baryon? Right, so the, I think the, the conclusion, conclusion is that baryon states viewed from single trace operator is a matrix product state. So, because you, I was computing D1, D2, O, and the idea is that this gets recombined into matrix product. All right, so, so let me just give you a final comment about like a, so this was the result I got from like a tree level analysis, but, and I got a weird selection rule, but there is some interpretation of that selection rule. So typically, if you have a selection rule, then it implies some hidden symmetry. And that is precisely integrability in this setup. So let me just briefly explain that, and then that's going to be the end of my lecture. So, so what you are computing is some uh, overlap between some state which carries particles and some states which describes baryons or determinants. And this, so let's just draw, draw a picture. So this is basically something like you have some particles and it gets absorbed by the state. And we found that the momentum must be uh, in this parity symmetric configuration. But if you rotate this picture by 90 degrees, then this picture becomes this picture, where you have incoming particle, P1 and MP2, and outgoing particle with momentum minus P1 and momentum minus P2. So this is precisely some reflection process in which the particles scatter and gets reflected. But what is uh, special about this particular reflection process is that there is uh, infinitely many conserved charges uh, conservation rule, which is basically given by this, where n is integer. Right, so of course, and so this 
is always true as long as you start from that particular select, like a set setup which uh, satisfies the selection rule and then rotate the picture. And this is basically telling you that there should be, there is a, should be some infinitely many conservation many charges. And the scattering process with this kind of, uh, so this boundary scattering process with this kind of infinitely many conserved conserve charges is called integrable boundary condition, and which was discussed by Zamolochkov, sorry, Goshal and Zamolochkov. And you can actually argue that if you have this infinitely many charges, then there is a nice consistency relation that you can write for this scattering process, which is like this. So if you, so you start from two to two scattering, then you act some set of conserved charges and then you arrive at the picture, which is something like this. Uh, let's see. So first of all, this uh, boundary scattering can be factorized into like a, a to like one particle boundary scattering. And second, by acting different set of supercharge, uh, sorry, conservation, conserved charges, you can also transform this into this picture. And because I just, what I did is just uh, act the sup, uh, symmetry generator, so these two processes must be the same. So this gives you, so maybe this is one, I guess. Yeah, this is what's called boundary and Baxter e equation. And this gives you a very, very strong constraints about what this scattering mat boundary scattering matrix is. And in the case of N equals force if MLs, we already know what the box S matrix is. So we just, we can just use that input and determine the boundary scattering matrix completely. And that basically allows us to go beyond like a weak coupling and one loop. And you can actually determine what this boundary scattering phase is at finite coupling. And using that, uh, you can use like a thermodynamic beta ansatz and various tricks, which is by itself a little bit non-trivial but I'm go not going to talk about that. Then finally, you, get, you can get a finite coupling. Answer. In a form of, in general, at finite coupling, it's given by some ratio of the functional determinant called Fredholm determinant. And the final answer is typically given by this kind of expression. So this Fred Home determinant, this Fred Home determinant are slightly different. Then you can take the weak coupling limit of this and then see that indeed you get this determinant over determinant structure. And then you can really like uh, compare it with the explicit weak coupling computation and then see everything works out nicely. So, so this, Sorry, uh, but, yeah. Uh, I mean, even for a single particle, Trace things. Mm -hmm. One didn't know at finite coupling there is things exactly. You knew it only in some uh, series, right? I mean, you knew it in some implicit way. In, in, in the, in the three, three point function of single trace operator, you would. Yeah. yeah, so here actually you can do much better. Why is that? Yeah, so, so the reason is um, so this prop essentially what we want to compute is that you have some boundary state. And then you have some operator state describing some spin chain state or n equals force of ML state. And the idea is to, in order to compute this, you just go to, you just first consider this cylinder amplitude. 
in the limit where this length is very large. So in the limit where this length is very large, this gives you, this is, gets factorized into the overlap between boundary state and ground state square times this uh, propagation factor. And so this is just like auxiliary length, and this, is, this length is the real length of the operator. And so this configuration, if you view it from the open string side, is just the thermal partition function in the thermal, some thermodynamic limit. So that's why you can actually use what's called TBA formalism. So basically, you just need to sum over all possible states and by like a labeling states using like a density of particles. So, so the idea is to, originally you have some over op possible open string state, but that gets converted into some uh, path integral of the density of the particles. And, and if you can also write the effective action of this, and then see, and you see explicitly that this effective action have a factor of R, which becomes like a, which can be evaluated at the subtle point in the large R limit. And if you take the subtle point, the subtle point equation of this effective action is precisely what's called TBA equation. And, but the subtle point itself actually doesn't give you this overlap, because if you uh, choose the subtle point and plug them in, you just get this exponential factor. And in order to, under, in order to compute this prefactor, you need to compute the one-loop fluctuation around this subtle point. And that's precisely why you get something like Fred Holm determinant. And that, is, that gives you the overlap between boundary state and ground state, which is the BPS state. And starting from there, you can do analytically continuation, analytic continuation and get the excited states. So this part is not completely logical, but there is some prescription to start from ground state expression to the excited state expression which was developed by Dore and Tadeo. And if you go through all the procedure, you get some modified Fred Home determinant and modified Fred Home determinant here. Yeah, um, I wanted, I mean, I, I didn't follow everything, but does this mean that what you're saying that uh, you can get an S effective that you had written down at tree level, the S effective itself you can get for all lambda? Right. So. So S, S effective, I didn't talk about it at tree level. So this S, S effective is completely different. Is that different from the S effective that you wrote, trace row square plus? Yeah, because in that case, S effective was multiplied by N. Here, it's only multiplied by R. So it's really like a two-dimensional quantity. But this answer is coming from the some S effective. So, but there's no interpretation. So you don't see the other open string. Right, so this, this yeah, uh, yeah, so. It's very tempting to identify the other open string description with this one. Ah, okay. Yeah, that's a good point. Because from the field theory point of view, this boundary state is basically, as I said, as I was saying, was create, was coming from like a two determinant operator, which creates some geodesic in a, geodesics in ADS. So, so this setup is, really the setup of the four-point function of the determinant operator, and in which like a sum single trace is exchanged in the middle. So from that point of view, you, yeah, it's very natural to talk about the open string, which connects this D brain and this D brain. And indeed, uh, yeah, it's very tempting to interpret it in that way, but at this moment, I don't know how to make it precise. Yes. Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. Okay. Uh, sorry. So, okay. Yeah. So, so this was the result for the tree level, and we also computed the uh, one loop result and then explicitly saw that this structure is preserved. Yeah. So you're talking about 
Ah, uh, okay, yeah. Right. So, right, so, so. Uh, yeah, it's, it's from the worksheet point of view, it's really the boundary state because we know that the dual is D-brain. So we kind of like use that intuition and then that's why we said that it's a boundary state. Right, so, so one could say that this matrix product state is the weak coupling expression for the boundary state or for the deep brain. So you would expect that as you do, uh, as you take it account, find it coupling, right. uh, yeah. you will, it will slowly become the, right. and at last the coupling it becomes. Yes, the yeah, product. yeah, it's really the boundary state. Um, ah, okay, so one thing we can, we, we did check is that uh, you take this expression, you determine this, what the reflection uh, factor is, and then take, go to the strong coupling. Then it really becomes the reflection uh, matrix for the Neumann and Dirichlet boundary condition, which is a kind of like a uh, reasonable from the fact that it's a D-brain. Uh, e, uh, yeah, well, it's, right, it's in some, yeah, it's some sense, yes, yeah, it's, it's, it's just a standard D-brain, but it's just complicated because it's in the curved space. Sorry, the matrix product state to string theory. Um, yeah. So in some sense, it's yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. I, I don't have a clear answer. <laughs> discussions of Chris here and now for two more days as well. So let's thank him for a very clear session.